Welcome to The Contrarians. Tonight we have a special Dark Horse album episode. Tonight we are looking at the first album from the band Lucifer's Friend. How many people have heard this record? I don't know, but we're going to take a look at it. Is this a Dark Horse album? Let's get started. Welcome to the Contrarians, and tonight we are doing a Dark Horse episode on the band Lucifer's Friend. Now, I want to go on record that me, Grant Arthur, I have no idea anything. I, I've heard of the band, but I have nothing to add in this episode. I don't think I've ever heard a track, but these gentlemen here have. So this is a Dark Horse episode. So, gentlemen, who, which album were you looking at? And is there anybody that wants to really start this off to get us going? I can start off. I mean, we're talking about the debut. That's what we're doing okay. here today. Yeah, okay, so that's... we're doing the debut of Lucifer, Lucifer's yeah. Friend, and that was, what, 1970? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to throw it over to Martin. He can run with it. And I figure we'll just go Martin, Peter Jones, and then Butch, and then... We'll see where it goes. We're going to keep it loose and we're going to talk about this record. Is this a Dark Horse record? We will soon find out. Martin, take it away. Well, okay. So, yeah. So, this was a band from Germany. And, um, you know, the the debut is uh, the, the reason that it's very utilitarian for, for a bunch of English-speaking pe uh, people is that John Lawton was brought in from England to be the singer on this. So, he's singing. His English, of course, is his first language, and he's doing a great job singing the vocals on this thing. Otherwise, they might have been... You know, a just a just kind of like a like a uh, slightly forgotten kraut rock, kraut rock obscurity, right? Um, but yeah, 1970 comes out in on Phillips in Germany, Billingsgate in the U.S. Who's uh, done? I can't remember who else they've done, but they've had some pretty interesting uh, uh, albums that have come out from uh, from overseas uh, that they've picked up in the U.S. Um, you know, I went and played the the preceding album. It's got an album that sort of precedes this that is is almost like a building blocks towards this. It's Asterix, Asterix. So it's a self-titled from Asterix. Um, but yeah, so they come out with this record in 1970. And, um, you know, sadly, we've lost John Lawton. Uh, he died in 2021. And the leader of this band, Peter Hessline, uh, has uh, died recently as well in, in 2020. Um, so what you get with this album, I think the song that everybody kind of knows from it is, is Ride the Sky, the opening track. It's uh, the most modern sounding thing on here. This is essentially a, um, you know, overall, this is a, is a considerably heavy album for 1970. Um, I'd say it's even heavier than Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath, but maybe not as heavy as Paranoid. Um, and probably about as heavy as your eye heat, very heavy, very humble, not as heavy as deep purple in rock, pretty much heavier than most things, uh, that, that came out before, because it is start to finish. Um, there's quite a bit of heaviness on, on all tracks on this, but ride this ride. The sky is kind of the anomaly. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, um, uh, like I say, almost almost like, like modern, like stuff you would get off of deep purple in rock or maybe, maybe fireball. Um, so there's, there's sort of. Richie Blackmore feel uh, to what you get on this on this album, but it's the funny thing overall. I I, I won't go through all the tracks, but uh, anyways, I, I'd say favorite what favorite uh, wise uh, the last track on the album, which is is the title track. It's it's, it's got this kind of haunting intro and subway sounds, and then it gets super heavy and it's proggy at the same time, and then the second track as well. Everybody's clown is really good. Um, there's a lot of Hammond. Uh, there's there's chord changes. It's recorded well. Um, it's up tempo. Um, but yeah, I won't go into the rest of the songs, but I just want to say something generally that struck me about this album in a big way. Um, you know, and I went back and looked at my old review, um, uh, in the collector's guide to heavy metal, um, volume one, the seventies, I gave it an eight out of 10. Uh, so it was really high for an old album. And, uh, like, like we were talking about before all their albums, um, you got about 10 albums. They're all, they're all quite different from each other. They kind of go down the kraut rock route at some points, kind of get poppy, disco-y, heavy at times, heavy when they come back. But this is the one everybody loves. So, but the general point I wanted to make about it is that I was really struck by a couple of things. Uh, it sounds like the Missing Link album between what you would have gotten after the three Deep Purple Mark I albums and in rock, it sounds like it just falls into that place. If the, if it was there instead of the classical album, it, it's perfectly, perfectly like that. So it's got it's got an element of being dated. Um, 
but but not particularly dated. Just to, it's almost like the very best things that you would want out of nascent hard rock in the 60s are there. And then there's there's this element which isn't strong enough for me, but there's an element of deep purple in rock. So that's one thing. The other thing that I find really funny about this album is it sounds like um, your least impressive songs from Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath and Paranoid. So your Rat Salad, your Fairies Wear Boot, your Sleeping Village uh, kind of song. So anything that you might, you know, your ears might perk up as a deep Sabbath fan and, and, and listen to on those first two Sabbath albums where you go, that's a little bluesy, that's a little jammy, that's a little hippie. You're getting a little bit of that on here. But otherwise, um, it's quite impressive because it is heavy throughout and like I say, well recorded. The vocals are fantastic. John Lawton is, is just a joy to listen to. Um, there are riffs all over the place, but there's chords, there's chord changes. There's, there's pretty surprising, uh, you know, mood shifts and stuff all over the thing. It's just a really well done album. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to mention, it's got a couple of different album covers, right? It's got kind of the white one. And then it's got, got the one where the, uh, you know, the, the tall guy and the little guy, the really creepy looking cover on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. I think that's most of what I wanted to say on this. Turn it over. Excellent. See, I'm here really to learn a lot of other people here probably tuning into this episode or trying to get turned on to this band. Maybe you don't know anything about this band. I have a couple of things for you, Martin. One, how did this band fare in Canada? Because in the United States, they're virtually unknown. How did they get much recognition in Canada? No, I, it's uh, it's unknown. And I don't believe I, I didn't check this, but I don't think there was a Canadian release. I do want to add one other thing. Um, I wanted to add um, what John Lawton told me about it when I interviewed him. I interviewed him in 2008 and in, in 2012. Um, and uh, let me just see if I could find the best stuff. I just cut out a little bit here. That's really if I. I was first introduced to Lucifer Friend, actually via Asterix. They, they said to me, we've got this album. There's a guy there who lives in Hamburg, an American guy called Tony Cavanaugh. He's done some vocals. Would you like to try some? I said, yes. Okay, fine. Uh, let's see. Uh, but it's not quite the heavy things the guy we're looking for. Then they said, listen, we've got some tracks here. We've done under the name Lucifer's Friend. Have a listen to these. See what you think. I had a listen. Had a look at some of the lyrics. And I thought, yeah, this could work. Um, just bear with me. It's getting better. There's, there's kind of a funny thing coming up. Um, let's see. Um, all of a sudden you find yourself in a studio and you're looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, they've taken something from Black Sabbath here. They've taken a little bit, little this, little of that, put it in a big pot, mixed it together uh, and had come up with something really unusual, brought it out and made Lucifer's friend, you know, uh, is this devil music and stuff? Is it going to work? Music uh, is in the ear of the beholder. Um, but yeah, so he says at one point, um, he goes, uh, the guys themselves are of that luck bunch that are able to read and write music, but also don't lose the feel when they play. So I guess they could all read music and stuff, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Peter Hecht is probably one of the best keyboardists around in Germany and still is who wrote the arrangements for the stuff. He never lost that feel for being able to play it live. Uh, don't know if it relates to Sabbath or not. I don't think there's a lot of classical uh, inclination in that. So I asked him about playing live and he goes, well, actually, we didn't. To be quite honest with you, we did at the time consider. We did go, uh, go out on the road and did a few gigs as we were. But the problem was that they were all living in Germany and I was living there as an Englishman, blah, blah, blah. Two or three of the guys, they worked in the James Last Orchestra. He was touring around Europe, very, very wow. big orchestral part. And you have to uh, earn your daily bread. We did try to take Lucifer's friend on the road in the early days, and it just didn't work out. When you think that those guys can go off and earn their money with James Last and then come back together and go out with and put Lucifer's friend together on the road, it wasn't financially viable project at that particular time. Having said that, in hindsight, we should have taken the bull by the horns and really seen it through. Later on, the guys without me, uh, I'd already joined your heat by them. They went out with men on the road um, and on and on. So there you go. That's all I got. Well, normally on these Dark Horse episodes, well, we not normally, but we always do. We always take a rating and we compile it at the end. Now, Martin, I know you've reviewed this record in the past. What would you give this record out of 10? I gave it an eight at the time. It's in my book as an eight. So I'm going to go with a 7.5 now. Oh, things. See, that's why I asked, because things change. Ratings change and, you know, 7.5. All right. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Martin. That was incredible. All right. Let's throw it over to Peter Jones. Peter Jones, Excellent. what's your thoughts on this record and what is your rating, my friend? Wonderful. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Happy to New Year to those who haven't yes. I haven't seen since the first of the year. Uh, we'll New get year. right to it. Um, you know, this is this. I'll go to a little more detail without being long, I hope. Uh, this is a doomy and kind of heavy album. It's got lots of musical ground that they cover here, though. Um, there's brilliant musicianship and, as Martin said, outstanding vocals. Um 
at moments, there can be some challenges sonically. While certainly for 1970, it sounds really good. It has the common issue of having a little bit too much reverb at times, which kind of recesses it back. So it doesn't have as much immediate impact, um, but the energy is there and the instrumentation is there. So that kind of makes up for it. Um, the drums are limited here, um, although you feel them probably more than you hear them. Uh, but it's not unlike what we heard from the early Scorpions records or those very early Judas Priest records, guys who were pocket players who didn't do a lot of fills, just kind of got out of the way and let the rest of the musicians take over. Uh, there's great thick distorted guitars and some exceptionally busy and aggressive bass playing, which I found unbelievably entertaining. Um, the addition of the organ just, you know, it feels like home to me as a, as a huge Purple and Heap fan. And for a brief moment, we even have French horn, which we'll get to in a second. You know, we talk about John Lawton and extremely powerful and full voice. Um, you know, he has a much higher range than what his tonal quality might give you the impression at first, but he can bring it. There's really not any limit to what he can do at the top. And while this is heavy and it's got progressive moments and covers a wide range of feels and tempos, there are you're not lost for melodic content here. These songs have some melody to them and they've got great choruses. And I think that's a sign of great composition. Uh, Martin talked about Ride the Sky. It's, it's a great opening track with all of the elements of what we would call early metal. And here's the French horn. And what does it do? It plays the immigrant song, allegedly. <laughs> so I don't get, <laughs> but there's your tritone. Right off the bat, I mean, we're we're conjuring already, aren't we? And it's and it's kind of drudgy and plotty, but I say that in the most glorious kind of way. It's a great riff that always pushes forward. The vocals are amazing, and I challenge you when you listen to this, after you listen to this track, go back and listen to Dreams in the Dark by Badlands, and don't tell me there isn't some close ties between the tonal qualities of Ray Gillen and what Lawton is doing here. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's a great breakdown section, great little short unison lead that they double track, and we've got more tritones. I guess they must be trying to conjure the devil right off in the first track. <laughs> um, keyboards add just the amount of punch to it and gets real heavy, great bass playing. I think it's a great opening track and was really, really fun to listen to. Um, Everybody's Clown, the second track, the Hammond starts out and instantly your ears are familiar if you know anything about Ken Hensley and what he's done with Heap. It's just so familiar and it's just such a great, great sound. This one's got a rhythmic motif in it that has become a staple decades later in a lot of metal bands and especially Iron Maiden. They use this repeated pattern of this da 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 Think of Clairvoyant. Go listen, you know, the verses in Clairvoyant. Um, and they're using that here. Um, it's a great breakdown, good guitar and uh, organ on here. It's a little more progressive than the opener. The opener is a little more straightforward. Uh, moves into a nice double time where we get a great solo from both guitar and organ. Then they've got a section where they hit these real tight unison punches, da -da, which are almost the exact copy of Gypsy from Uriah Heap. And they're actually even in the same key and they may even exactly be the same chords which is okay. Again, it's something familiar. You just went, oh, cool. Um, and I also think this was a great track and I'm really happy two for two here. Uh, Keep Going opens with a guitar tone. And here, go back and listen to the guitar tone that Tommy Bolin used on Love Child. Um, very similar, um, the guitar sound between those. This has got a very different feel than the previous two. Um, slower but it's got a lot of weight to it um again soaring vocals from lawton um and then they do this great little unison machine gun pattern where they all fire off together which is nice and tight and then it quickly changes style in a more progressive way to this heavy quarter note shuffle feel um you know think of evil woman you know the song by crow of course the cover from black sabbath and you'll get the sense of what what that feels like as it's driving through in a quarter note feel uh, it moves back to the slower section before it gets heavier and finishes out. Nothing wrong with this track at all. It's It fits right in. I like the change of pace feel and tempo wise. I, again, nothing to complain about here. Toxic Shadows opens with keys followed by the whole band. A heavy, heavy unison riff. 
so much great bass playing on this as you know what we should do a separate show on on bass players of the 70s because they just late 60s and 70s because they ruled everything <laughs> they are just amazing um i appreciate the weight the song conveys this, there's a nice keyboard breakdown a great solo section um and then we get into this really great solo and it's got elements of iomi on the debut album but then all of a sudden what do i catch a little bit of that Eastern harmonic minor he throws in there. I'm like, what? Is Richie in there? What's going on? And that sounded great. I mean, they've got little snippets that they've kind of just taken or were taken from them. We can call it whichever cart and horse we want to do here. But it's it's familiar and it's recognizable and it's elemental to what we consider metal. Um, they put on a full-on jam at the end and it's, it is a great run out to the end of that track. Uh, Free Baby, uh, organ, goes into this very propulsive quarter note, four on the snare, uh, moving pattern. That's something that Purple do, would do on In Rock. Um, you know, they're singing about relationships. So it's, this is not a, a, you know, a devil. They're not conjuring anything in this one. This one's more about relationships. Um, not as dark uh, until the solo. And then it does start to turn back a little more dark. Uh, but it's a straightforward track. And it was kind of a nice palate cleanser. Uh, from the heaviest and and the fullness of the tracks prior. Um, Baby, You're a Liar opens with this nice call and response between the guitar and the band. Uh, it's slow, but again, another another driving riff into the verses. Uh, stunning. My favorite organ solo of the album is on this with some more great bass playing. Uh, wonderful band punches until they do this kind of sweeping chromatic ascending line that builds to this driving end. And, and I think that's great. Um, you know, there's nothing overtly complicated. Um, you know, they're not going off onto too many tangents. I mean, if you're looking at the times, you know, five minutes, six minutes, three, five, I mean, they're not huge. They're not these long epics, but they're not the three minute, you know, quickies. So there's some content here and they do make some changes, but they flow nicely and the transitions work. It's not just a section and another section that somehow were butted together. And now you've got a longer track. Those kind of drive me nuts when they just don't seem related. Um, uh, number seven, in the time of Job when Maman was a yippie. What a title. I'm not sure what to do with that. <laughs> but buggy esque Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's got a, a very small kind of cream harmonies that Cream was doing very early on, especially in, uh, you know, Disraeli Gears and Wheels of Fire era. Um, this one is probably the most like if I was to give it an, an analogy. Yeah. <laughs> Marty, yeah, Grant's just going, oh, I don't no, know. did you see that? No, a, a, a thumbs down just showed up on, on Grant. And I don't even, I didn't again. even give a thumbs down. Oh, no. Peter, I give you a thumbs up. <laughs> I didn't see. Oh, and now you got sparkly fireworks. Of course, I'm a professional, um, for God's sake. It's It's the most psychedelic track. Um, and this one is the most dated sounding. And I don't mean that in a bad way. This sounds like 1970. And that's okay. Um, it's a nice section. And finally, we've got some Tom work. I, I wasn't even sure at first if he even had Tom's on his kit because he, he, he just doesn't hit him. Um, and an, a nice riff to a very abrupt and sudden ending. And you're like, oh, okay, they're done. Let me just uh, inter inter interject track. for a second, Pete, Peter. Uh Marco and I did a show this morning. There's a new button at the bottom of Zoom says AI Companion. And we were reading everything about it there. And we don't know what it means. What and, is that? And I said, should I just activate it? It says, should you enable it? So I enabled it this morning. My computer's been off. But I wonder if that if that little thumbs down that came up twice is something to do with AI. Might might have I know I that's know. a Mac thing because I can trigger it, you know, by doing this. And oh, oh, I oh, see. It's a yeah, Mac thing, but... The thing that I, I did not do this, yeah, I did I, not do this, and I don't know why it came up. So that's uh, weird. Oh, see, oh there, there it is it again. Is. Well, that's because I did this. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that, you must you must have done you that. Must have done I it. Didn't notice, yeah. Uh, yeah I know. Sorry. But anyway, sorry. Like, go on, Peter. You didn't like my cream comment. I love your <laughs> cream comment. <laughs> my notes um, say that too. It says I feel fine. There's a part in there where you got that. Yeah, da, da, it, it, yeah. yeah. So then we get to Lucifer's friend. Uh, this is really doomy and very heavy with intro, great intro punches that builds to the verse. Uh, changes to even darker section, if you can believe that, uh, with a great, great guitar solo section. Oregon takes over, they in increase tempo, and the song just starts to push forward. And then we have our first really kind of screams from Lawton. Uh, and he, till the end, is kind of unleashing. And he's got a, just a tiny section where, like the end of, uh, uh, you know, Strange Kind of Woman, where, you know, Gillen just lets it fly live. You know, Lawton lets one go. And it's, it's pretty cool. So, I mean, you know what? This is a fun album. 
Um, but it's also a very one-off. Um, there really isn't anything remotely like this uh, in the rest of their catalog. And it almost, at points, doesn't even kind of seem like the same band. Um, you know, they have, this is a kind of a one-of-a-kind one trip down what they would classify as heavy metal. 70, they're not saying that. Um, but I found it very well executed uh, and performed. Uh, small production issues, but heck, it's 1970. Which ones don't, right? Um, you know, uh, this stuff could have gotten very old very quickly with a subpar singer and, and less musicianship, but it doesn't. It stays together brilliantly, and I think it holds up well. Great guitars, bass playing, everything is great. So my point is, is this a Dark Horse album? Well, I kind of guess it depends on what you're measuring it against. So I will use a sports analogy. You can be tops in your high school, or you can be tops in your district, or you can be tops in your state, region, et cetera. This is never going to be in the big leagues. It's just not well known enough. Just It's just too obscure, too uh, out of the weeds, in the weeds. But in comparison directly to other material of its ilk, Man, there, there's no issues calling this a, a, a straight up success. And this easily sits side by side with a lot of our favorite albums, heavy and what would classify now as metal records of the time. Um, you know, I'm really glad that I really dug into this. And at this point, I'm, I'm giving this an eight out of 10. Uh, I just, it's, I think it's a great album and worth a listen. So. Nice. Wow. So does oh, anybody on, on the panel know why this wasn't a success? Was it? They didn't have backing from the record company. I mean, did it just kind of get lost between other acts? What label did this come on out on? Well, it was it was Phillips there. I mean, it's, it's, it's because they were out with James Last and they weren't touring and they didn't put together a band and they didn't move right. to L.A. or whatever. Right. So, I mean, they're just a bunch of German guys. Right. Be before. Right. Before yeah. Scorp you know, four, five records before Scorpions made it big. Right. Or, or even broke out at all. Uh, yeah. You know, nobody broke out of Germany for a long, long time, right? No, no. They had all these things. You weren't allowed to have a manager. I remember the Scorpions guys told me that once. It was this bizarre thing they said about it's against the law to have a band manager in, in Germany uh, in, in the 70s. Some some kind of stuff like that. But uh, anyways, we got to let Butch talk. Let's let Butch talk. And we'll, we'll, we'll say more after. <laughs> all right, cool. Butch, are you ready? Uh, so anyway, I've got... I guess ready isn't going to be. I think Peter and Martin covered so much ground. I feel like I could just like coast on that like that was thorough we've got a 7.5 and an 8 i'm looking forward to see how you rate this so give us your thoughts and then your rating after the at, at the at the end um i came to lucifer's friend probably through uh first of all you know it was part through being a uriah heat fan and then part through you know um it's one of those records as a guy who was in a doom metal band for quite a while it, it's one of those records that's kind of revered in those circles and a lot of people um know about it um you know the people that are you know folks into proto metal like it's one of the big records i mean like peter was saying i mean ultimately like to get to the issue of whether it's a dark horse record or not i you know among though that group of records like peter said i mean it's a it's a legendary album i mean um and ride the sky is a, a classic um you know in that grouping I, I, plus in terms of uh its own their own catalog i mean it's definitely the best record in their catalog by far um they did some good stuff afterwards the the, the catalog's kind of patchy and odd but uh this like as far as like the the whole record being cohesive um heavy um well written and well played i mean all their stuff was well played but uh this record really brings everything together in one spot um i mean for the time it's probably one of the five or six heaviest albums of that era easily um for 1970 i mean these guys just missed being the first kind of metal band by six months i'm you know it came out at a time when you know the first sabbath album and in rock and uriah heap's first album came out it's right in there with them in terms of heaviness i think um i i, I know martin and i have briefly talked about this in in messages back and forth before but it's kind of like one of those things like you're always like Folks that are real, you know, especially like Doom Doom fans, like into lo always looking for that next Sabbath thing from back then. Like, but you you get into these bands and they just always come up short in terms of heaviness. Kind of, they're heavy, but they're not. Like at the same time, like Sir Lord Baltimore, people throw around a lot. Now it's heavy, but it's kind of like super loose and jammy compared to like that heavy, like riff heavy, like punch, punch you in the gut, knock you over, kind of heavy. Um, and now this album, I think, has a lot of that. Um, 
John Lawton's voice is, is amazing. I mean, that's, that's worth the price of admission alone. Um, you know, he's doing the, he's right in there with Dio and, you know, he, to me, he sounds kind of like a cross between like, he's got that powerful, um, voice like Dio had like it's like Peter was alluding to like it's um or, or saying like his voice is deceptively high like you hear it and it's so full that you don't realize that he's hitting notes that are they they sound lower than they are but you try to sing them and you're shit out of luck um and in addition he does hit some legit like just super high notes on this album I mean he's an amazing singer um and uh, over the years I've come to appreciate him more he wasn't a guy like in the 80s I didn't really know much about my Knowledge of Lucifer's Friend was relegated to an album called Mean Machine that we, my one of my buddies found at the, we found it at a secondhand store and he bought it and honestly it was kind of like I don't know, it wasn't I didn't think it was great at the time, but uh, then in years to come like I went back and you know found out about this record but uh, you know the guitar playing on here is fantastic, um, the keyboard work I'm a sucker for like um, the keyboard and guitar interplay and. Uh, you know, Peter Hessel on guitar and Peter Hecht on keys are amazing. Um, I think they play together well. I mean, it, it does conjure up, um, you know, some of these great duos like Blackmore and and Lord or Mick Box and Ken Hensley, you know, and then, you know, you have the, it's the, but it, they get a little bit heavier at times. Um, the rhythm section is tremendous. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, let me see. Uh, Ride the Sky, I love. That's probably my favorite song on the record. Um, I always thought, you know, that when I first heard it, of course, the, the I think one of the first things everyone notices about it, like Peter said, is the the French horn thing. And the, the I, mean, I would love to know, like, when the song was written and when they threw that in there, because Zeppelin three came out in October 1970. These guys were in the studio around that time. And I would love to know, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg with that. But that song's tremendous, like propulsive, heavy um vocals are great you know lawton right off the bat at the beginning just going going for the high stuff um everybody's clown is great um I, again some great high notes from lawton in there i love the tempo of it the, the way it just moves along um keep going you know as far as like proto doom songs like man this is like the verses in this is like do me like hand to doom do me and then it uh it kind of gets set off that chorus like pops in and it you know picks it up but then it brings it back down it just it's the way that that song works going from that slow like heavy kind of verse into the 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 pickup but the thing i like about the verse too with the vocals is just the way that each pass each pass of the the vocal line their lawton gets higher each time and more intense so by the time he gets to the chorus i mean that last line of the verse is just like you know so intense um Toxic Shadows is great. I love that extended guitar solo in the middle from Hess Line. Um, in the Time of Job, when Mammon was a yippee, um, you know, I have done it's an in your face rocker. Um, I love uh, those, the, the, the fr kind of frantic keyboard squalls that Hecht puts in the middle of the song. He's just sort of squonking away, um, which is awesome. And then uh, Lucifer's Friend is my other like favorite song. You know, these are the songs, the highlights of the record for me. Um, Lucifer's Friend, I, I, I love it. it it's setting up a creepy doomy atmosphere and the chorus is, but the um the verses are kind of you know heavy uh and mid-tempo but then that chorus just the way that the music underneath is kind of creepy and then the way lot is singing the, the the come take my hand i'm lucifer's friend tonight is the end of your way that whole thing is like so dark sounding and you know really like you know do me before there was such a thing as as doom metal um i think a couple of the other songs like i love the whole record but a couple of the other ones like uh free baby and um uh you know i think are not as good as the others and sound give the album like i think that's where the where the album can sound a little bit dated at times but these are my you know these are minor things i mean not every song can i mean i guess sometimes every song can be a 10 but um i just think uh overall the record's tremendous oh and again at the end of Lucifer's friend i love from about the 415 mark to the end of this song where it just keeps like building in intensity and it kind of reminds me of um that hectic middle section of child in time where it just keeps like it's like speeding up and getting more frantic and lot is just like as it's going on just wailing more and more and more and then around the 554 mark he just hits this banshee like scream in there that's just like i mean this guy, like, definitely, I think, is one of the most unsung 
singers like it total um totally like how it set the stage for like what would come later with guys like halford and dickinson and you know even he even like did predate Dio a little bit in terms of this you know style of music you know Dio wasn't really doing heavy heavy stuff heavy heavy until you know 75 so um tremendous um i love the record i give it an eight out of ten um and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really consider it a dark horse. I consider this as like, a, it's a classic, I think, like underground classic. It's it, along with the the Sabbath and Deep Purple from the time. Like, I can't think of too many records as heavy as this one or as, you know, Captain Beyond, maybe the first Jerusalem record. But, not, you know, it's an insanely addictive, intense record. I, I really enjoyed like spinning it a lot more in the last week. It's been a while since I picked it up. That's why I saw that topic. I'm like, well, I got to do that. Nice. So oh, wicked. That was awesome, Butch. Thank, thanks Man, very much. You guys are yeah, all over that, it. That's cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So so far we have a seven point five and two eights. I just want to throw this out here because you guys mentioned like Peter mentioned Badlands and or was it Blue Murder? One of the two. I get Badlands. those four, Badlands. Badlands. How influential was this band on bands that followed them? Because. It seems like this this band's probably more of a band that musicians follow than the the record buying public, and I'm just curious: is were they very influential with the Peter I think musicians and I, stuff? I don't. I've never read any interviews mm. or anything where anybody brought up Lucifer's Friend. Not yeah. that I'm familiar with. Yeah, this is the this is the kind of band that, um. I think you get to unless you were around at the time and knew about them or you're a big heap fan. And so you, you know, look at the other stuff that those guys did. Mm -hmm. um, they're the kind of band you, you find out about and get the record by someone else. Like my buddy stomp um, saying, Oh, but you got to hear Lucifer, the Lu first Lucifer friend album. Did you ever hear that? Or did you ever hear the first Jerusalem, Jerusalem record? These are albums that were, they weren't well distributed in the United States, first of all. Um, mm -hmm. And then we're, have been out of print for years. Um, and so it's uh i think they're more influential pro and pro i would almost bet that they're more influential on not the generation that was kind of like following them then but on like guys like me or musicians around you know my age or a little bit that like found them later because mm -hmm. i don't know bands like there are a couple bands that have covered um beelzefuz uh, was a band covered ride the sky i remember uh and you know, I saw them actually play it live one time with Eric Wagner singing on it. So, um, wow. cool. Well, yeah, I the reason some, I, I, I'm sorry. No, go I ahead. Think, well, I was just going to say, go ahead. Yeah. No, please go ahead. No, I was going to say, I just thought that maybe this was a similar kind of situation because you look at the band Big Star, out in 1972, 73, didn't do anything, but then got rediscovered later, like by REM, and promoted up to like one of these bands where a lot of these bands, you know artists go oh my god so influential and i didn't know if lucifer's friends was one of those type of bands we're no, all opening here today they like, weren't they no. weren't that, that's no, they're not I, a big I, star really no no what i, I was going to say is to me this is the kind of album that shows up when i start doing retro uh history diving where i'm looking at the bands that i like and i do it all the time with drummers i'm like oh i love these drummers but who did they listen to and i start to go back to who they were influenced by. Right. And in this case, if I like an era and I like a certain style of music, I try and as best as possible, find other little gems that may have been out there that didn't catch any public attention, but yet still had some elements. We know there's a million more impressionist painters than the ones we can name on one hand or any other art form. And if we saw their work, we would probably admire it if we're fans of that style of painting. This can't be any different. And there's, it was just this one-off at the right time in the right style that just, like Martin said, you could just pull a drawer and put it in with your socks because mm -hmm. it it just works. But that's not something that, you know, a, even mainstream or even off mainstream artists are going to go back and go, yeah, you know, there was that lick in Lucifer's spread. <laughs> I don't yeah. think that hey, you true. never know. I just wanted to mention a couple more things just to make sure I make use of my notes. But uh, but actually, one thing that Butch brought up very eloquently and actually, Peter, you too, when you both talked about the vocals, um, I hear Klaus Meine in here as well. And I've never asked the Scorpions guys. They would be a, a, a dead sensible answer to were you influenced by Lucifer's Friend? Because their first album doesn't come out until 72. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're they're, uh, you know, uh, 
quite kraut rock to begin with, fairly kraut rock on Fly to the Rainbow, getting heavier, getting heavier. And you wonder, uh, had these guys been an example, an exemplar of some sort, right? Um, and I love, Peter, when you brought up um, Crow, Evil Woman, Don't You Play Those Games With Me, because that's what, when I say this is a little bit dated and it's a little lacking in personality, I think of the, I think of that's a perfect example from Sabbath, right? Um, right. And, you know, uh, other things that I thought of along the way, I'm looking at my notes on, on the on the specific songs, but parts of this reminded me a little bit of uh, early April Wine on record, Electric Jewels, April Wine. Um, I'm hearing a little bit Iron Butterfly, Steppenwolf in here as well. I definitely hear that Iron Butterfly, especially in those guitar solos sometimes. There's something about the sound um, of the, the solos. There's like yeah. a um, there's like a feedback or there's like a almost like a uh, rever reverby. I'm not a I'm a fucking singer. So what do I know? But I know what I'm trying to say. Like, but there was like a, like a vibe that the, you know, that Eric Braun had in, in Iron Butterfly that I, I can hear in some of the guitar playing on this record. It, and that's what kind of like dates it, I think, as compared to like Blackmore and Iomi. It's like in between those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, Another point I wanted to make was that, was this idea of um just a, a going back to metal evolution when we did, went back to the very earliest, heavy metal of all time right and the earliest thing we could find was the walls of jericho knocking down the walls of jericho with the horn of jericho and right. this ride the lightning thing is exactly like that this literally is is the uh the modern music version of of blowing down uh blowing down a building with music right when you when you hear that horn thing in there that that always comes to mind and the last thing i want to say is is we always used to compare this song as kids or growing up or whatever to gun race with the devil right uh, uh ride the um uh, ride the sky and and uh and that one actually that reminds me yeah halloween's got to ride the sky too yeah. right which is a totally <laughs> different too. song right so which is kind of interesting so uh yeah well, that's a turnover and just a quick point uh whether you agree or not is would be interesting unlike the early sabbath which is a separate conversation which you guys have already touched on i don't hear a lot of blues in this i don't this, either this is almost way more metal than its predecessors and its contemporaries at the time this that's almost stripped away completely here which makes mm -hmm. this as as butch pointed out so perfectly why it just feels so heavy there's this, there is there are no 12 bar blues in here there's none of that not even close mm -hmm. yeah but there is hippie music though right there are hippie there's some psychedelia yeah. yeah 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 i wanted to correct myself real quick too i i said beelzefuz covered the the song i was i'm thinking of it was trouble covered it on their simple mind condition record i did see them live though i saw beelzefuz live and eric did come up and sing it with them but the, that was the connection i just wanted to step on mm. that before someone catches me in the comments right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well and if just one quick last thing i think it's worth mentioning uh, as a drummer when we're talking about sabbath and we're talking about your eye heap and let's talk about lucifer's friend i think these bands work because these are drummers who play much more sparsely. They play open with space and with air and it breathes. You can't be an overtly busy drummer and make this kind of stuff work. And when I think of doomy, like super doomy metal today, I think it's exactly the opposite. All I hear is just double bass drums that just go on for a thousand years and it's exactly flipped. It's the opposite. Here, the drummers are out of the way. Curse Lake was that way. Bill Ward was the master at it. Space, breathing, color, and just letting everything else breathe and let the instrumentation as, a, as an ensemble create the heaviness with their foundation. And I think that's an interesting point because evolution changes. And there are tiny elements of fudge in here as well. But they had Carmine. And that was different. Plus, it's a little more melodic and a little more song-oriented. But you would never confuse Carmine with the other three that I just mentioned. Much busier drummer, brilliant as he is. But I thought that was kind of worth pointing out that this drummer in this situation worked just like Curse Lake does and just like Ward does with Sabbath. Nice. Yeah, very cool. Last thing I have is um, it's, it's, uh, I couldn't find, um, I did, I was doing a search on YouTube. I could not find, obviously, the, there's no, I think there might be a video of them doing ride the sky with Lawton singing um yes. like one of those shows but there's no but there's a full concert from uh it's like 76 or 77 they had a singer named mike Starr singing for them mm, it's right. a rock palace thing it's pro shot it sounds beautiful they play great um so i just want to say you know if there's a, if there's fans out there um 
of the band to to check that out too because it's a really cool performance i mean they ride the skies in there um but some of the other material they play is really cool the opening song is great and uh i was just watching that a couple days ago and thinking like that singer is really great too um mm -hmm. so that's all nice. very cool very cool yeah. all right cool excellent i think we pretty much covered it um like i said we're just trying to turn you on to some of these bands that no one really talks about and i think based on what these gentlemen have said um, we've got a 7.5, an 8, an 8, and that comes out to a 7.8. I would give the stamp that this is indeed a Dark Horse album. We want to hear from you. Go in the in the comments. Have you heard this record? What do you think of this band? We want to hear from you. Is this a Dark Horse record? Is this one of those records that should have gotten more eyes on it back in the day? Is it, I mean, I... I don't even know how you could even buy this nowadays. Probably Discog's your best bet. I never, I don't know if this has ever been reissued. I think it's, I think it's been in print and reissued has over it? the years. I know Repertoire put it out, and okay, I, I can't imagine it's not in print in some way on CD. Yeah, or probably LP. one of those European companies that yeah. uh, reissue companies probably have had a. Well, they did a, a reissue in what twenty? Sorry, got my notes. Uh, they did a a re-release in nineteen ninety that added five extra tracks, and then go. they did a re-release in twenty ten that added two more. Awesome. So somebody did something. So there you go. Go out and find this if you haven't heard it already. Like I said, we're just trying to turn you on to some new stuff, some new old stuff, ladies and gentlemen. So does anybody else have anything to add before we wrap this up? Oh, you guys did great. Yep. That was awesome. All right. I want to thank times. Peter Jones and Butch for coming on tonight, talking this stuff. If you'd like to be on these panels, you can be on these panels. We have a Patreon, which have a lot of great discussions. The link is below. We also have merch. Check that out below. We also have Kofi. If you want to buy us a pint or a cup of coffee, we would love it. Also, we do, we do like donations. So uh, we do this because we love music. And we're really just trying to turn you on to stuff that maybe you haven't heard. Or maybe you've heard of it and you want to revisit it. Who knows, ladies and gentlemen. So anyway, gentlemen, I want to thank you for coming on. This was a great discussion. And like I said, I think we can certify this a dark horse record. Very cool. Sounds good. All right, Thanks gentlemen. Thanks so much, we'll guys. See you. Talk to you later. Bye now.